expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. But they should. But they should be. All right. Glad you're with us tonight. We're going to help to convince you that the views expressed on this show and other shows like it, and what does the Bible say, should be the views that you have when it comes to what the Bible is saying. We'll always give you a word from the Lord. Friends, James over here with you. Glad you're with us tonight. Here's how you can reach me. 276-340-2653 is my phone number, wordfromlord at gmail.com. And we hope to hear from you. We appreciate those who are emailing us and uh, watching uh, online, trying to get our shows up on YouTube and other uh, places where you can have access to them. So we appreciate you uh, watching and uh, studying the Bible with us as you have opportunity. And... Um, I hope that you will take advantage of what uh, Caleb offered you. You know, friends, I've said this before, we have Bible studies uh, more than half of the week, uh, if I'm doing my math right. Uh, Sundays, you can assemble in Martinsville, Danville, or Eden, two to three hours a day, uh, and uh, study God's Word. On Tuesdays, you can be in Danville. On Wednesdays, you can be in Martinsville. On Thursdays, you can be in Eden studying the Bible. That's four days a week out of seven. So over half the days of the week, you can be studying the Bible with people who love the Bible and who are always going to make sure that what you're getting is right from the Bible. On, th on Thursday nights in Eden, we're studying the book of uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians. And uh, I believe a very good study. I'm enjoying it. And uh, on Sunday mornings, we're actually going through Bible geography in our class, and I think that's an excellent study. I'm actually teaching that again on, on a Monday mornings, and uh, uh, it's just a very rich study, a way to go through the Bible and see things you've never seen before. I actually thought the, the illustration that Caleb used, I thought he was going to tell me it was from geography class, and I was going to feel good about it, but he kind of shot me down on that. But anyway, that's fine. But, friends, that's the, way, that's the way it is with members of the Church of Christ. We're always studying the Bible. We're feeding off each other, giving... Um, uh, helping each other to see uh, things in the Bible that will make application to help you understand what the will of God is and hopefully will help your life uh, be fuller and richer as you strive to know what God's will is. So if we can help you, we want to do that very thing. We want you to uh, come out and take advantage of, of the times we're studying together. Last week, last week we had a, a, a man that called in and uh, he asked a question. We talked for a good while, I think about 16 minutes actually, and, uh, or 15 minutes, and, and uh, he had some good comments, kind of got a little rocky start at the beginning there, but he made a comment that I want to share with you, I want to um, uh, bring this back to your uh, remembrance, as Peter said, stir your minds up in the way of remembrance of what he said, and that's where we're going to spring from uh, tonight. So let's just start with this statement that, that the gentleman made. I can find the church I'm in in the Bible. I can find what we practice in the Bible. Can you find the church you're in in the Bible? Its name and practice in the Bible? Oh, I don't, I, I'm not a member of no organized church. Well, you're not a member of any church then. Because the Lord's but, church is organized. The church you're in the Bible is organized. Uh, well, I'm not a member, I'm not a member of any, of uh, any of the church bodies because they're all flawed, including yours. I don't have one, sir. Love you. All right, so... Several times he's, he's talked about my church, and I keep emphasizing I don't have a church, which I know people, they still want to, in, they insist that we have a church, but really it's not, friends, it's the Lord's church. But nonetheless, did you hear what he said? I'm not a part of any organized religion because they're all flawed. Now, friends, I thought that was very interesting. Why, what does that mean, number one? I'm not a part of any organized religion. I think that's just another way of saying I just don't want to go. I stay home. I don't want to be a part, be around people. Now, I can understand why, really. He said they're all flawed, and I know what he means by that, and I really agree with him to an extent. They are all flawed. Actually, friends, when you're talking about a religious group or any religious group, it's flawed. You want to talk about a civic group. You want to talk about the Lions Club, the Kiwanis Club, whatever. They're going to be flawed, too. You know why? Because people are involved. But churches of men, churches of men are flawed for two reasons. Number one, as we just said, it has people in it. And any time you have people involved, there's going to be mistakes. There's going to be flaws. There's going to be individuals who are not uh, behaving like they should. And therefore, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have issues with personalities, people wanting things their way. They're going to be you know, babies about some things, insisting on getting things done their way when really they uh, uh, 
uh, don't have any right to, or maybe they just have a trouble getting along with people. That's that's one thing. It's one thing to say that a a a a group is flawed because there's people in it. But friends, that's everybody. That's everybody, including the Lord's church. It has flaws because it has people in it. But the difference is, the difference is how you deal with those flaws, which brings us to our second point. The reason why so-called organized religion is flawed, like the man said, is because man has devised the rules in the churches of men. In the religious groups that men have organized and designed and set up and established, they're flawed because men have come up with the rules on how to behave, on what goes, and what, what is acceptable and what's not acceptable. And friends, have you ever stopped to think that the reason why people are so uh, put out with organized, quote unquote, organized religion, <clears throat> is because men have made rules that then they come back and they change again and again and again? I mean, the Southern Baptists, they have their convention and they change the rules. The Methodists, they have a... They have a, 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 a uh, a discipline, and they change the rules. It, it, it molds, it evolves, it changes. The Mormons, the Mormons for a long time said that black people were accursed. And then comes along, and I can't remember, I think it was like 1979, it was pretty, it, it wasn't in the, the far long ago, that they changed the rules and said, oh, you know what, that, that's different. That's different. The Mormons again uh, uh, changed, the, uh, changed their law, their so-called divine law, when it came when it uh, came to the uh, subject of of uh, uh, bigamy, you know, having multiple wives, because all of a sudden I don't know they got another revelation. So I don't know wh why they changed it. If it's divine law, why they change? You see, they're always changing, and then that just promotes hypocrisy. That makes everybody out, out in the world who are on the outside looking in at all these religions. It makes them say, you know what? That's just a bunch of man. Such a bunch of of uh, of hypocrisy, and therefore. I don't want to be a part of that organized religion because I don't want to be part of that hypocrisy. And friends, that's exactly what we're talking about. When we have individuals uh, in the churches of men who are promoting themselves, who actually use the gospel for gain, you might say, who actually have, a, um, uh, have, a, have an intent to uh, use so-called church, organized religion to promote themselves, that is what causes people, that's what causes people to then uh, be dismayed or turn away from it because they think, well, that's the way everybody is. I want you to notice this in Second um, Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. Let me get my, my Bible program open here for you. Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. Listen to what Peter says. He says, but, but there were false prophets uh, also among the people, uh, false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. Now watch this. Uh, Uh oh, my, did my computer freeze up here? Uh, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Verse 2, it says, And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with flattering word, with feigned words, Make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, uh, uh, lingereth not, and their uh, damnation uh, slumbereth not. Now, friends, that's what we're talking about. Individuals who have made merchandise of so-called religion, and that makes everybody else speak evil of it. That makes everybody else say, I don't want to be a part of it. I, I, I still remember, I still remember when I had... Uh, I, w I was debating Larry Serber. Many of you remember Larry, and we're standing on we're standing on the set. We're standing in that room right over there, or in the next room over there. And a lady calls in, and she's talking about how she knows that the Bible's right because there's some kind of chromosome that was uh, found, and it's shaped like a cross. And she saw it on YouTube, and therefore she knows it's right. 
And Larry was scoffing at that. Larry was scoffing at that. And I, I whispered to Larry, I said, I said, she saw it on YouTube, must be true. And he laughed. We're both laughing at the same arguments because that, and I told the lady, that is why individuals like Larry Serber, the atheist, said, I don't believe this nonsense because all these kooky so-called Christians are out here believing every little thing that, uh, uh, that they see in nature is, is evidence that, that God created it. Like the, uh, our friend who's tried to answer us several times up in, uh, 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 not Ridgeway, horse pasture, you know, he's got the little fairy stone cross over there. Well, there, there's, there's, that, that's God designed. It's a cross there. Really, friends, that, that's your best argument for, for there's a God? It's a cross-shaped rock? Now, now, friends, here's my point. There's a reason why people are leaving or don't want to be associated with organized religion. Organized religion. But, friends, I want you to consider something. Organized religion is based, man-made religion is based upon man's decisions. And that's, that's what I'm saying. That's, this is why it all comes down to who makes the rules. Notice this. Here's a statement that a lady makes, very telling. She's in uh, uh, the Martinsville Church of God, Mercy Crossing. This is what she says here. Listen, listen carefully to what she says. <clears throat> Talking about Jackie Poe. I love this. I'm in Jackie's church. Jackie's church. Jackie's rules. I love this. I'm in Jackie's church. Jackie's church. Jackie's rules. I love this. I'm in Jackie's church. Jackie's church. Jackie's rules. Jackie's church. Jackie's rules. Well, might as well be his church. It's not the Lord's church. You see, that's what we're talking about. And so people see this. Anything goes. And the result is, the result is they say, I don't want any part of it. I don't want any part of it. There are so many religious beliefs and practices <clears throat> that, that everybody can't be right. Everybody can't be right. And so when you're talking about organized religion, you need to stop and, start, stop and think for a minute about religion in general. There are so many groups of individuals who believe so many different things. Notice this. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 22, Acts 17 and verse 22, here's what the Apostle Paul said to the, uh, the folks in Athens. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your uh, devotions, I, I found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declaring to you. He said, you're very superstitious or you're very overmuch religious. You're, you're, you're very, very, very superstitious. Uh, and so he's looking at all these idols. And friends, that's what we're seeing today. You see all these people have all these different religious groups. And so that's why people like the man that called in, they don't want any part of that. They don't need part of this so-called organized religion. Because it's so, it's so uh, convoluted. But notice this. In all of these religions, some of them are not organized. Some of them are not organized at all. As a matter of fact, take a look at this. Just to show you that not all religions are organized religion, you can tell by how they behave. Notice this. my microphone while I sit.
All right, that's enough of that. Now, you see what we're talking about, friends? There is so much disorganization that at best you can just call it religion, unorganized religion. And I can see why people won't be a, don't want to be part of an unorganized religion. But here's the thing. True religion, true religion according to the Bible is organized. It's organized. And you should be a part of it. Now, I want to show you what organized, true organized religion is like and why it is organized. Why is it called organized religion? Number one, it's organized religion because Christ is its ruler. Christ is its ruler. Now listen, a ruler, someone who's in charge, is going to bring order. He's going to bring order out of chaos. He, he, no, not a lot of crazy stuff's going on when you have a person in charge. Well, Christ is the head of his church. And he is bringing order. Notice this in Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28 and verse 18. Jesus said unto, uh, unto them, or Jesus spake unto them, saying, All power is given to me in heaven and in earth. All power, that's all authority. So he's, he's in charge. He's the ruler. He's the ruler. Ephesians uh, chapter 1 and verse 22. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. God put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him that filth all in all. Christ is the head. He's the ruler. Now, if you've got a ruler, that means you've got someone who is in charge you got someone who is in charge and who's going to be uh, making decisions. He's going to be making, the, uh, making sure things go a certain way. Now, Christ built his church. Christ built his church. In Matthew chapter, uh, let's see here, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. And I say unto, you, unto thee, that thou art Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, Christ was going to build his church. Now, most people, when they see church, the word church, they're going to say religion. Okay. Christ is going to start his religion. As a matter of fact, the apostle Paul left his father's religion and became a Christian. All right? He became a Christian. So, we're talking about he changed religions, you might say. But the religion that Christ established is one that belongs to him. Now, friends, if Jesus is the, if Jesus is the head, then he's going, to make, he's going to make it orderly. He's going to have order. He built his church. Now, when people are talking about my church, and they, when they ask me and they say, well, you know, your church, your church, that's what the gentleman that called in last week said. <laughs> Friends, I don't have a church. And the reason why Christ said upon this rock, I'll build my church is because it belongs to him. It's not a man-made church. It wasn't started by a man. It wasn't founded by a man. It was not named after a man. It wasn't named by a man. It just belongs to Christ. And therefore it bears his name. It is the church that belongs to Christ. The church of Christ. It is his church. And so when we're talking about organized religion, when we're talking about the Bible, we're talking about this particular church, the church you read about in this book. All right, now, let's listen to what this, the caller from last week said on this matter. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now, where did he ever command anybody to be a member of a man-made church? Find, find the Baptist church in the Bible, sir. Your church is man-made. I'm not. I don't have a church. You just got. You just got a certain name. I don't have a church. Church is man-made, sir. I don't have a church. Well, the church you attend. I'm a member of the <laughs> Lord's church. Under. I'm a member of the Church of Christ. You read about in this book. Okay, the Church of Christ. Some man came up with that title because there was no Church of Christ until. They, they decided to, to name it the Church of Christ. 
Sir, the Bible talks about the Church of Christ in Romans 16, 16. How long have your church been in, in existence? I don't have a church. I'm telling you, I don't have a how church. Is it, how long has the church that you sit in been in existence? The church I'm a member of is the Church of Christ. It started in A.D. 33 in, on Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. Okay, who was the, who was the original uh, uh, pastor of that church? All right, now... See, the man was asking me questions. He's talking like a denominational person. And I don't talk that way. I want to give you a word, my Lord. If I'm going to speak, I'm going to speak as the oracles of God, 1 Peter 4, 10, 11. So I'm going to tell you what the Bible is saying. When he says, the church you're in, your church, I don't have a church. And I don't sit in a church. See, when he says you're the, the church you sit in, he's talking about the building. And again, it's not the building. The church I'm a member of is not a building. The church I'm a member of is the group of people that have Christ as their head and therefore they listen to him. They take their orders and direction from him. Now, he said who, when was it established? When was it started? Well, it started on the day of Pentecost that you read about in Acts chapter 2. That's when the church of Christ started. How do I know that? Because the Bible talks about that church. We know Christ said upon this rock, I'll build my church. All right, <clears throat> and we know that he tell he told Peter uh, that he was going to give him the keys to the kingdom. I will give unto thee the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bound on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. In other words, what Peter bound on earth was already bound in heaven, and what he loosed on earth was already loosed in heaven. Peter was was one of the apostles that could say. What goes and what doesn't go? What happens and what doesn't happen? And Jesus said, I'm going to build my church, or I'm going to uh, give you the keys to the kingdom. Well, in Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 2 and verse, uh, let's just look at Acts chapter 2 and verse, uh, well, let's start in Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, on the day of Pentecost, you have all of these devout Jews in Jerusalem. And the apostles, the apostles are here in one place, and, and suddenly there came a sound uh, from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and filled the house, and filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared up unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. It wasn't fire, it just looked like fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, there were uh, dwelling in Jerusalem, devout men out of every nation under heaven. And when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Now, as we come on down to what happened here, Peter and the other eleven are standing up and they're telling people, you killed Christ. They're convincing them, you killed Christ, you, you crucified Christ. You're murderers. And they said, uh, in verse 37, Acts 2, verse 37, the people said, men and brethren, what shall we do? They were pretty in the heart. said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized. Everyone is you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So Peter is telling them, this is what you do for the remission of sins. Now, notice this. They were gladly baptized. They that received his word were gladly baptized. Acts 2, verse 41. And the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Who's them? Who's them? Well, who were they added to? Well, come down to verse 47. Acts 2, verse 47 says, have, uh, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added unto his church daily, into the church daily, such as should be saved. When they were baptized, they were added unto them. When they were baptized, the Lord added the saved to the church. So the church is important. It is the church that Christ established. It's the, it's the church that he's the head of. And therefore, it is the church that the saved were added to. When did it start? On the day of Pentecost. And so I'm a member of this very same church. I'm a member of the very same church you read about in Acts 2, verse 47. How do I know? Because I did the very same thing they did in order to become a member of the church. I heard the gospel. I believed it. 
I, I confessed Jesus Christ uh, is the Son of God. I repented of my sins, and I was baptized for the remission of my sins. And thus the Lord added me to this, this very same church. Now, the man said, well, who was the first pastor? Well, friends, you know what? I have an answer to that too. In 1 Peter chapter 5, I want you to notice this. In 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter says, The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder, and witness of the suffering of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be uh, revealed. Now notice this, verse 2. He tells those same elders, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, nor wi but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Verse 3. Neither being lords over God's heritage, but being example to the flock, and when the chief shepherd shall appear. Now you know what a pastor is? A pastor is a shepherd. And the chief shepherd is Christ. So the first pastor, the first pastor of the church that I'm a member of is Jesus Christ. Now, if you don't understand what a pastor is, you don't understand the role of a pastor, then you might not understand that. Now, there are other men that God has determined should be pastors in the church. We'll get into that in a moment. But the first pastor of the church was Jesus Christ. That is why I say I'm a member of the Church of Christ. So, to the gentleman that called in and want to know who the first pastor of, uh, who, who the first pastor was of the church I'm a member of is Jesus Christ. He's the chief shepherd. Now, the reason why I say Jesus Christ has a church and I'm a member of it is because I know he's the head. Friends, that is organized. That's an organized religion. An organized religion has a head, someone who's in charge of everything. All right. You're on the word of the Lord. Hello, James. Good evening. He didn't. He wasn't baptized for the remission of sins. What, what was he baptized into the church? No. I want you. I want you to read Matthew. Listen. I want you to read Matthew chapter three. Okay. You go. Okay. You, read, you, you read Matthew chapter three, and you start reading in about verse thirteen. Matthew three thirteen, and you read through the end of the chapter. And then you tell me, you call back later and tell me why Jesus was baptized. Okay? Okay. Give you a little homework okay. or something. All right, Matthew, okay. Matthew, th Matthew 3, 13. Bye -bye. All right, bye-bye. All right. So I'm going to start giving people homework. All right. <clears throat> You'll learn it. When I was in school, I asked a teacher a question one time, and I, and I, I said, what, what's the answer to this question? He said, go look it up. And I said, well, why can't you just tell me? He said, you'll remember it. If you look it up, you'll remember it. You know what? I, I still remember it. I, I remember it. So anyway, uh, anyway, so we're talking about uh, uh, organized religion. Organized religion. Friends, if a religion is organized, it's going to have a ruler. And Jesus is the ruler of his church. So that's why I'm a member of organized religion. It's because... Jesus is the head of the church I'm a member of. All right? Now, if you've got organized, if you've got organized religion, you're going to have something else. You're going to have commands and corrections. Now, this is essential for organization. It makes sense that if you have a ruler, you're going to have rules. And remember, in, in Matthew 28, Matthew 28, <clears throat> in verse 18, Jesus came and spake to them, saying, All power is given to me in heaven and earth, as are all authority. Now, what did he say to them? Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Now, as a ruler, he has authority, and he gives commands. He said, Go teach, baptize, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Now, that's what you call an organization. 
That's what you call an organization. He started his church. He built his church. He purchased it with his own blood, Acts 20, 28. And so Jesus started his church, and then he organized it. How did he organize it? He organized it by giving commands. He organized it by giving instructions on what to do, how to carry them out, what to do. And then he told the people how to carry it out. He said, go into all the world and teach the gospel. Now, that, that's, see, friends, that's what I'm talking about, organization. If, if the church that Jesus built was not organized, then he just said, I'm going to build my church and y'all to do whatever y'all want to. Now, that's how some people believe, Jesus said. But he didn't say that, friends. Jesus gave instructions. He gave instructions. He gave commands. And thus, he passed down the authority. He passed down the authority on what was going to take place. I want you to notice this. In, um, uh, well, let's just look at 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 37. <clears throat> just to show you that as an apostle, the apostles had authority to make the rules. We already read Matthew, um, uh, Matthew 16, verse 19, where he told Peter, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven will already have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will have already been loosed in heaven. In 1 Corinthians 14, 37, listen to what Paul says. Now, he's an apostle, so he has the authority to make some rules. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. They're the commandments of the Lord. Paul is giving commands of the Lord. Now, I find it interesting. Sometimes people call up and they say, well, I, I just want to do what Jesus said. I'm just going to do what Jesus said. I, I don't do, what, Je I don't do what, what Peter said. See, I, don't do, I, I, I follow Paul. I don't do what Peter said. Or I don't do what uh, Paul said. I just do what Jesus said. Well, you know what? Peter and Paul both did what Jesus said. Jesus gave his words to the apostles. Look at this. In John chapter 17, and uh, we're going to look at verse uh, 14. John 17, 14. Jesus is praying to the Father, and he says, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Now, what did he do? He said, I have given them thy word. I gave them the word that you gave me. Now, are the apostles speaking the words of, God, of Christ? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. He says in verse, if you come on down to verse 17, Jesus says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Well, the apostles had the truth. How do I know? Because Jesus said, I gave them thy word, and thy word is truth. Therefore, he gave the apostles truth. See how easy that was? And he said, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Verse 19, he says, and for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Their words? Yes, their words. The words that they got from Christ, that, they got, that he got from, from the Father. So the Father's words came to Christ. He gave them to the apostles. They became their words, and they are speaking the truth. Now, friends, those are the commands for organization of the church. These are the commands. These are the words that the apostles were supposed to use in order to have this organized religion. You see, because commands bring order. Commands stop all the chaos. I want you to notice this. In 1 Corinthians, let's look at 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 34. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 34. Now, Paul has been talking to these individuals about the Lord's Supper. In the context, you're talking about the Lord's Supper. They have abused it. They've turned it into a big common meal. You know, they, they're all bringing their food. Instead of, instead of the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine, which they should have been using, they turned it into a big meal. And he says to them in verse 20, he said, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. But notice what he says in verse 34. He says that if any man hunger, let him eat at home. Instead of making this a big common meal, he said, let him eat at home. And he says, 
that ye come not together unto condemnation. What's he doing? He's giving them commands so that they won't be condemned, so that their worship will be orderly. And he says, the rest will I set in order when I come. I will set in order when I come. In other words, he's going to give some commands that will straighten things out. Look at this in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Here's the same word again. He says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given, look at this word, order, as I have given order to the church of Galatia, even so do ye. He gave them an order. What are they supposed to do? They're supposed to follow the order. Why? So that things are done decently in order. What's the purpose of Paul giving this order concerning the collection for the saints? He says, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God has promised him that there be no gatherings when I come. The command that Paul was giving was to organize the church. They were to be laying by in store upon the first day of the week so that the function, so that the purpose of the church could be carried out. And he says, you do it on the first day of the week. Why? Because they were already assembling on the first day of the week. In Acts 20, Acts 20 and verse 7, notice this. And upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached and them ready to depart on tomorrow. And he continued his speech until midnight. They were already assembled on the first day of the week to partake of the Lord's Supper. And so Paul says, when you come together upon the first day of the week, what you do is you lay by in store. You lay by in store so that when I come, there won't need to be any gatherings. In other words, everybody wants, oh, let me, let me get the money that I've set aside. Let me, let me bring it. No, you should have brought it the first day of the week. Lay by in store so that when I get there with my companions and we're taking this, um, uh, uh, this gift, this, this, uh, this money to help out the, the needy in Jerusalem, <coughs> we don't have to wait for everybody to go home and get it. It'll be ready. Okay. There's no gatherings when I come. See, it's an expedient. Well, what does, where did that originate? It came from Paul giving the command to lay by in store. See, friends, orders, orders create order. Commands create order. And that's what Paul's saying. Look at this. The, when Paul said in 1 Corinthians 16, 1, I have given order. That word means to arrange thoroughly. It means to institute or prescribe. So Paul is telling them, this is the prescription. This is what you do in order to maintain some order, in order to um, make things a little, uh, uh, to make things more uh, expedient or efficient. That's what orders do. Now, if someone says, well, I don't like, I don't like organized religion. Well, friends, if you don't like organized religion, you don't like commands. You just don't like taking orders in. Is that it? You just don't like being told what to do. That's, that may be part of the problem. People say, well, I don't like organized religion. Everybody's flawed. Well, it may be. That may be the case. But it may be that you just don't like orders. That same word, by the way, is Acts 24, 23. Acts 24 and verse 23, where... A centurion was commanded to keep Paul. And he commanded the centurion to keep Paul. He commanded him. Go do it. Now, I know we live in a society where people say, well, I, I don't want to do stuff. You know, I, I, I don't want I don't to be told what to do. That's why you don't like organized religion. You don't like to be commanded, do you? You don't like to be restrained. You don't like to be told, well, you can do this or you can't do that. Now, I know that's the truth. But see, friends, organized religion has to have orders. In 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 14, look at this. The same word, same word, 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 14, is ordained. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they should preach the gospel, that they who preach the gospel should live with the gospel. Now, you see that word ordained? We hear that a lot. Oh, I've been ordained to preach. I've been ordained to preach. Well, friends, number one, if you've been ordained, if you've been ordained, 
the Bible says it was ordained from the Lord. Now the Lord, the Lord preaches or the Lord speaks through his word. So show it to me in his word if you have been ordained. In other words, ordained is the same as command. So if women preachers have been commanded, if they have been instituted, if they have been prescribed, if they have been arranged thoroughly in the church or in a religious group, if they've been arranged by the Lord, show us the scripture. See, friends, it all comes down to command. It comes down to the authority. Who is telling you to do what you're doing? You want a word from the Lord? No. But the Bible says that uh, if you're so much of a living person like a prophet or something, can you heal anybody? I thought he told his disciples to do this. I, I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding you. Say it again. All I heard was, can you heal somebody? And then he hung up. Okay. Uh, so I don't know. I think he was making a dig at me. That's fine. I didn't understand it. So call back again, sir. I couldn't understand you. Turn your phones down, folks. When you call in, turn your phones down so you can, so we can talk because there's a delay. All right? Uh, especially if you want to do a drive-by a drive by caller, you know, calling in and just uh, making a, uh, trying to make a pot shot, all right? Turn your phone down so we can hear it good. All right. So, we'll say that was a miss, I guess. Now, so friends, so everybody who says you're ordained, number one, if you say you're ordained, then you don't turn around and say, well, I don't like organized religion. Because organized religion has ordination in it. Or it has commands in it. It has someone prescribing what is right and what is wrong, what you can and what you can't do. All right? But in it, if you say you're called of God, especially if you say you're a woman, a woman preacher and you've been called to God, show it. Show it. Give, it. give us the commands. Otherwise, it may be organized, but it's not the Lord's church. It's not the Lord's organized religion. Okay? So it is because... Uh, organized religion has orders in it. Uh, here's, another, here's another verse. Titus 1 and verse 5. Paul said, For this cause lift out thee in Crete, that thou should have set in order. Now that's a different word than what we've been looking at. He said, That have set in order the things that are wanting, and ordained elders in every city as I had appointed thee. Now that word appointed is the same word we just looked at. Same word we just looked at. Paul gave a command to Timothy to set an order. Paul set a uh, command in place for Titus to set some things in order. Now this word actually means to set in order additionally or to straighten out further. Sometimes maybe like this. Mom comes in and says, says uh, I straightened up the living room, but you pick your stuff up and take it to your room. Still some clutter in the living room, right? Mom is straightened up a little bit, but she tells the kids, all right, you take your stuff and you take it onto your room. In other words, get the rest of it straightened up. Or maybe somebody says, well, I've done the dishes. I, I've done the dishes, but you need to dry them and put them up, all right? Some things have been ordered. You do a little bit more. You go a little bit further. You finish, you finish what needs to be done. And that's what Paul tells Tim, Titus. He says, you stay in, in, in Crete. And you set in order the things that are lacking. You set in order and ordained elders in every church. No, there's two things there. Titus was to set in place. Set in place. <clears throat> now, friends, if you're talking about organized religion, you've got to realize that there's sometimes there are some commands that need to be followed in order to make sure there's uh, order so that other things can get done. Look at this. Let's, let's go back to uh, Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Uh, verse 3. Paul says, I besought thee to abide to Ephesus, 
when I went to Macedonia that thou might have charged some that they teach no other doctrine. Now, friends, if, if you're against organized religion, then you've got to be against commands. You've got to be against rules. But the Lord's church that he established, he established and he put rules in place. That's why it's organized. That's why it stays organized. That's why I know some of these churches out here that claim to be the Lord's church, that claim to, be, that claim to love the Lord and so forth, I know they're not the Lord's church because they don't follow any of the rules. They want to say any doctrine goes. And Paul says to Timothy, I, saw to, I wanted you to abide at Ephesus and you could charge some that they teach no other doctrines. Now Titus, Titus, look what Titus was to do. Let's go back to our verse here. He says, thou should have set in order the things that are wanting. So there are some things that need to be set in place. Maybe there were some doctrines that need to be corrected. Maybe there were some teachings that need to be uh, uh, taught. Maybe there were some uh, uh, things that were left undone, all right, that need to be done. And then he says, and ordain elders in every city. So there's two things that Timothy was to do in order to make sure the church at, <clears throat> at Crete was organized correctly. Now, see, the Lord put orders in place. He put orders in place to put men in place who would keep the order. Now, elders is what uh, Titus was told to do. Ordain elders. Uh, elders are bishops. Elders are the same as bishops, same as presbyters, all right? Same as shepherds, same as pastors. All talking about the same office, all right? Now look at this. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1, this is the true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. If a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop must then, must be uh, blameless, must then be, a bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife, a woman can't be a pastor, she can't be a bishop. She can't be an overseer. She can't be a presbyter because she can't be the husband of one wife. Vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not give, excuse me, not given to wine. Uh, one that rules his own house well, having his children in subjection. These are all rules. These are all qualifications for these elders, these pastors, these bishops. This, these are the men that God has determined are going to help keep the church in order. Now listen. Someone says, well, do y'all have elders in the church where you are, James? No, we don't. You know why? We don't have men qualified. We don't have men qualified. Someone asked me, he says, well, why don't y'all have elders? Well, who's going to be the elder? Who's going to be the elder? The guy, the guy that's not married, doesn't have any children? The 90 year old man, you know, who's going to be, who's going to be an elder? If you don't have men qualified to be an elder, you can't have elders. Now you can still, you can still be organized religion because you still have the book. See, you still have the word. You just don't have men to fill this capacity, but God designed the church so that it would maintain order that it would maintain a, a sense of decency. And that's why he tells Titus and he tells Timothy <clears throat> to ordain elders or to appoint elders, put them in place to keep things ordered. Now, friends, in these so-called organized religions today, I can see why people don't want to be part of them. They're not really restrained. They're not really whole, uh, uh, being guided by anything other than their own self-will. That's what they're really being guided by. But see, the reason why God said put elders in every church is because there's a need to look out for people's souls. I want you to notice this. In, in Hebrews chapter 13. Sorry about that. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 7. 
Paul says, remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow considering the end of their conversation. Them that have rule over you. You know what? The only people that have rule over someone else in the church are elders. And even then, their rule over someone else only goes as far as the Bible allows them. Now, friends, you know why pastors, so-called pastors today, you know why they lord over the flock? You know why they take control of their churches? And matter of fact, the Baptist uh, manual actually says that the pastor has the final say in all things to the church. Sounds like the Pope to me, you know. But you know why? You know why they do that? Because they're not following this book. This book does not give an elder full authority across the board to do anything he wants to do. Oh, no. No, 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 no. This is the law that keeps everybody in check, whether it's elders or deacons, evangelists. Any Christian is, a, is accountable to this book. It is the ultimate authority in the church. That's why the church can stay organized. That's why it can stay. That's why it can stay so orderly. It's because of the, of the Bible or the book that we use. All right? In, uh, and, and so when we're talking about organized religion, listen, friends, the Lord's church is organized. It has a ruler. Christ is the ruler. It has the commands that are the rules. And notice this. It has individuals, it has individuals in it who are then conducting themselves according to the, uh, to the Bible. Now, listen to what uh, this caller from last week says again. One more video from him. Okay. I, I do recall a scripture in the Bible, and I know you're going you're gonna to explain it for me. It was a scripture where um, the people were, um, they were uh, prophesying and casting out demons but they weren't a part of Jesus' group. And when Jesus' people reported back to him, Jesus told them if they're not against me, then they must be for me. Well, the only way they could be doing that is by the same power that Jesus and his disciples were doing, it, and that is by the power of God. That's why he that said they not to what, be with That him. is not what Jesus said. He, he said if they're not... If they're, if Jesus they're, simply said, if they're not so against gonna, me... Okay. So you're going to... And gonna, I don't believe that the Presbyterian... You're going to tell me, I'm going to explain it, but then you're going to uh, explain uh, 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 All the Baptist go. people and all these people are against Jesus. Do you? I believe they're all against Jesus. Yes, sir. They're all against you. Now, the man, the man's wanting to know about uh, a verse where Jesus said, or where disciples came and said, you know, there was one that was casting out and uh, was not with us. And they wanted, they wanted him rebuked. And Jesus said, uh, if he's not for me, he's against, uh, anybody who's not for me is against me. Now, I want you to notice something, friends. Most people, most people want to believe that all these religious groups are for God. All right? They think, well, we're all, we all come to be Christians, therefore we're all for God. But friends, that's just not the case. Uh, let's see. It's in... Uh, sorry about this. The reason why... The reason why I answered the man as I did is because everybody who was casting out demons in that day was doing so was doing so by the power of Christ. Now friends, the only way they could do that is if they were doing it by the same power are the same authority that Christ and his apostles were doing it. All right? Now, 
if, if they were able to do that, and I'm looking at Matthew uh, to, uh, 17, no, I'm sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I know the phone call. Okay. I'm looking at, I'm looking for a Matthew, here it is. Matthew 12, 28. Jesus said, if I cast out devils by the spirit, if I cast out devils by the spirit, ah, If I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. Jesus was casting out demons by the power of God. So if there was someone that these folks didn't recognize was doing the same thing, they had to be for Jesus. That's why he said, if it's not for me, it's against me. Whoever is, uh, who, whoever is not for us is against us. So this man was doing it by the same power. That, was, that does not say, that does not mean that he was part of a denomination like these folks claim. There wasn't even a denomination in the days of Christ. As a matter of fact, Christ's church hadn't even been established when they said that. And so don't give me this we're all part of a, of a different group. If you're following Christ, you're going to be following the same rules that he set up, that he set forth. You'll be put, putting forth the same rules. Now, friends... This is why we're saying organized religion, yeah, majority of organized religions, I wouldn't want to be part of either. But the true organized religion is the church because it changes people's character. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 40, we behave decently and in order. That's with dignity. And all these churches of men that are carrying on, hooping and hollering, there's no dignity there. That's why I wouldn't be part of organized religion either. But if you want to be a part of the organized religion you read about in the Bible, here it is at the Church of Christ. If we can help you to do that, we want to help you. Give me a call, 276-340-2653 or wordfromthelord at gmail.com. Till next time, friends, thanks for watching. Always make sure you're getting a word from the Lord. Have a good night.